In the UK, one in five working age adults are disabled. And despite increased awareness to make workplaces more inclusive, disabled people are twice as likely to be unemployed. Furthermore, the disability employment gap in the UK is 29%. With more people reporting long-term health conditions or disabilities, it's crucial we work together to create workplaces where everybody can feel confident, safe and supported. I think as someone who has a disability myself, I'm deaf blind due to a condition called Usher syndrome. I can recall being 16 and looking for a part-time job and being refused um, purely because of my disability and all while my friends were getting jobs at the same place. Um, and that did a lot to damage my mental health and self-esteem. Um, and a lot of it came down to the lack of awareness and training, um, people stereotyping. Um, and I hadn't even started life at this point, you know, so that was kind of my first introduction to how society was maybe going to be treating me. Um, so I think there's there has been a lot of change since then, but there's still a lot of work to be done, um, which is why I do a lot of what I do to try and raise awareness and kind of break those stereotypes and barriers to, to enable more inclusion in the workplace. I think we can all be uh, embrace inclusive work more. And, and I think the environment is one now where there's every opportunity to do that, both in terms of working more flexibly and the demand for new skills in the workplace. Inclusion is something that should be a given, really. It shouldn't be an afterthought. So we should all start from the position in our organisations that we want to be an inclusive organisation. And, and then you don't have to spend all this time retrofitting adjustments into your workplace. Um, obviously, there are specific adjustments that maybe individuals might need, but generally we should approach inclusion as something for everyone. The first thing I'd consider is for organisations to consider how they upskill around accessibility and meeting the needs of, uh, of the disabled workforce. Inclusion should be uh, at the forefront rather than an afterthought. And I certainly would invite employers out there and listeners to this uh, talk today to consider how they make their organisations more inclusive uh, and accessible too. I think by increasing the organisational culture and knowledge around accessibility, it means that when a disabled employer then comes to apply to work in your organisation, you've already got some baseline understanding around that. And then you may want to seek out to you know, meet the individual needs of that employee as well. And people like Molly, who live with their disabilities all the time, are, you know, from my perspective as a doctor, a real expert resource. So if I see somebody with a condition such as asthma or diabetes, uh, I may have a certain medical background knowledge uh, and awareness of that. But actually, the individual will have so much more insight into terms of what medications have worked for them, what treatments they've responded to, etc. And I'll often tap into that as a doctor. And similarly, employers may consider doing the same thing and tapping into the resource and the expertise of their employees as well. So I think a broad uh, organisational upskilling um, in terms of accessibility responses and approaches could be helpful, but then also utilising the innate expertise of your employees when they come to you with their needs is also important as well. You know, when you talk to our disabled employees, it's the small things that make a difference. So are you inclusive? before you even you know before you even have to ask someone are you asking for someone's access needs when you send out a meet, meeting invite rather than waiting for them to tell you are you making sure your presentations are in an accessible font and color um, so those are things we've really really tried to work on and probably one of the most successful things has been the launch of a, an employee network so we have a network called um, enable which um, which I, I sponsor um, and uh, that brings together employees who are disabled, allies, people perhaps like myself who um, I have a 15 year old son who has a neuromuscular condition called spinal muscular atrophy, he's a wheelchair user. So anyone in the business who has passion for whatever reason and that has been amazing um, and that it's a kind of you know it's a way for the business to really understand well what more can we do and it's a way for employees to unleash passion around something that they really want to do something about. So really good example is, you know, some very um, inspired employees have just designed an amazing bit of tech to put on our products, a QR code that will help people who are partially sighted at a distance read all the product information that they need. Um, you know, and so actually by opening up the discussion and by helping people who have passion for it do something, it's a massive win-win from a business point of view as well. Um, so I hope that's kind of a bit of an overview, but we are not there yet by any stretch. We've got a long way to go.
One of the challenges is people thinking it's, it's someone else's job. Um, you know, they care about it, but they don't care about it enough to be their job. Um, so it should be part of everybody's role to be considering it. Um, so at Nexa Digital, when we run our inclusive design workshops, we've worked with teams across the board, you know, whether it's front uh, customer facing or back end dis digital designing and things like that. Um, it, you do bring it back to the bare basics of awareness because I think a lot of the time people stereotype still um, what disability actually means. Um, it was mentioned earlier, statistically, there's one billion people worldwide with a disability, but you've got all those people that go undiagnosed for a long, long time, um, you know, and, and people that don't, um, they don't identify as having a disability or an impairment. And when thinking about accessibility or accessible design, you don't necessarily have a disability. Um, so it's about creating that, that culture where you feel you can come forward and talk about these things to then make it more inclusive for other users, employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think for us, it's really just embedding that um, communication um, and awareness um, and really starting at the at, at the bare minimum with awareness training um, and then kind of, you know, training with like assistive technologies and getting real life users involved. Because, um, I mean, even my story, I'm, I'm deaf blind, but I'm one person. And if you meet one person with disability, you can guarantee the next person will be completely different. Mm. And it's the same within the communities. You know, if you, if you meet one blind person, you've met one blind person. Um, so I think it's very key to make sure that businesses are aware of that and just kind of promote that open-mindedness around disability because it's it's never going to be one one shape fits all it's really important to draw upon all the richness of diversity and insights that you have across your organization to to lead really well no uh, one person fits into a box and we you know we talk about 14.6 million disabled people in the uk there's a richness of diversity within that 14.6 million. And so I think it's really important that you get to speak to a really good range of disabled people in terms of trying to understand what changes you might want to make. A black disabled person will have a different experience from an LGBTQ plus disabled person, from someone who's uh, maybe a parent of a disabled child or a carer. So all of those experiences are going to be important and relevant for you to run your organisation really well. And it's important that you're yeah, really inclusive in thinking about things in that way. I think just as doctors do in consultations, remember the person in front of you, your employee, or in the case of a doctor or a patient, is an expert and knows their needs in a manner which is so much more intimate than you will know for yourself. And so tap into that, tap into their insight, ask them what their needs are, uh, start a dialogue. I'd also show though that actually you shouldn't rely on them as the expert either. They'll have their own personal view on things, but they shouldn't be a spokesperson for all people that are disabled or all people that have a particular condition. Um, theirs is their own unique take on that. And so um, while they can be relied upon for an insight, Site. It isn't, you know, the voice for all people that are disabled or have access needs in your organisation as well. I'd also see that um, there are some uh, disabilities and uh, differences of abilities that are actually sought out as well. So I know some of the big tech companies in the in the states, for example, will actively recruit for individuals who have neurodiversity because of the talents they bring to an organisation. So I think for us to be framing disability as something we have to work around in a negative sense is, is very false because actually there are many talents and, ta and skills, as, as uh, Mark and Molly have alluded to, that can be brought to a workplace. And so to recognise that can be key as well. I'm personally not asking for everyone to be an expert. It's always going to be a work in progress. Mm. We're never going to have cracked it. You know, it's, it's never going to be like that. We've always got to be looking for those new approaches, new people and perspectives within the communities and, and taking those on. And it's down to you to be listening um, and taking that on and embedding that into your, in your working culture. Yeah is then being humble enough to say, do you know what, we don't, we don't understand it all either. You know, you don't have to be an expert. And I think that's really important for senior leaders to be willing to say that. Because line managers, by and large, in my experience, people in, in big companies, they want to get it right. And they're really scared of getting it wrong. And so that's the barrier that I think senior leaders can help people to overcome, to say, look, I, you know, I, I don't know it all either. But there's lots of resources out there to help, you know, where we've got partnerships with the um, 
Business Disability Forum, other organisations, um, and you know, and as everybody has has said, it's the disabled person themselves will um, almost certainly tell you what they need and help you to to make your workplace more accessible. So I think that's one thing, and showing up for the big events. So you know, we've had a we do a lot of purple light up day and purple socks, and we've had lots of great guest speakers. We've had a chef quite recently who cooked everybody lunch, and he, he's. Um, He's deaf and you can imagine working in a busy kitchen. So he did a fantastic kind of presentation on while cooking us dinner on actually how he's remodified his entire working space. And, you know, we had a, a, some of our senior leaders showing up for that really important. Um, and in particular, where people feel comfortable sharing their own lived experience. We've got a senior leader who is super charismatic, really well liked um, and nobody had a clue that he has a form of muscular dystrophy and that actually he can't manage theirs. And I think two and a half years ago, he probably wouldn't have been comfortable sharing that. Now he is sharing that and it's really powerful and it's really making people think. So I think there's lots of different things that senior leaders can do, but, but listening, being humble and being visible, I think probably the most important ones. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. It's been um, super informative. It strikes me there's still so much to do in this area of uh, inclusivity. And uh, for me, key learning is create the right environment, listen as leaders, treat people as individuals, and uh, that'll be a great start, as well as uh, really dialing up our curiosity.